This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. <coughs> Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asiratun Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. Previously, we were uh, discussing an event from the, uh, towards the end of the sixth year, or rather, excuse me, an event in the sixth year of the Prophet ﷺ's residence in the city of Medina, uh, the sixth year of Hijrah, known as the campaign, the Ghazwa, the campaign of Banul Mustaliq. And so, we talked about the incident itself and how uh, if you look at it in the overall scope of the life of the Prophet wasallam, and especially some of the major events like Badr and Uhud, uh, Khandaq, the trench, and so on and so forth, it's actually much more of a smaller event, meaning that it didn't go on for very long. Very quickly the Muslims were able to achieve victory. There was very, very minimal uh, loss of life on both sides, not just the Muslim side, but even the side of the non-Muslims. There was very minimal fighting and very minimal loss of life. So the event, the battle itself was concluded very quickly uh, and very briefly. However, this is a very notable event for a couple of other reasons. There are a couple of other things that occurred and transpired during the course of this campaign and also on the journey back from this campaign, which puts this particular incident, the uh, the campaign or the Ghazwa, the battle of Banil Mustaliq, it puts it at a, uh, in a very important place in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and therefore it's very integral to the study of Islamic history. So one of the things that transpired at this particular time that we talked about in the previous session, is the incident involving the hypocrites. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn, ibn Sulul, who was the leader of the hypocrites, his um, comments about the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, and the subsequent fallout because of his comments, which eventually were concluded and were resolved by the revelation of surah number 63, surah al-munafiqun. And we talked about that surah, we talked about the event, and then we went through the surah, sort of a brief, you know, kind of translation and run through of the surah, where we were able to see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that incident and everything that it involved. One of the other things that, um, notable events, that occurs on the journey back, or in the aftermath rather, of this battle, Banil Mustaliq, is that one of, the leader of Banul Mustaliq, the leader of their tribe, his name was uh, Al-Hadith. His name was Al-Hadith. He was the leader of that tribe, Banul Mustaliq. He, in the aftermath of the battle, of course, they had surrendered, they had all been taken into custody, the entirety of the tribe. And his daughter, whose name was Juwaidiyah, and actually we find out later on her name would be Juwaidiyah, at that particular time her name was Barra. Alright, this was an Arab tribe, they were mushrik, they were idol worshippers, this was an Arab tribe. And her name was Barra. So as they were being distributed amongst the Muslims, you know, and put into the custody of the Muslims, um, 
this woman, the daughter of the leader, Al-Harith, whose name was Barra at this time, she was put into the custody of an Ansari, a Medinan Muslim, by the name of Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas. Thabit bin Qais. She was given into his custody. She is actually recalled and remembered to be Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. The very first time that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha saw her, she describes her as a breathtaking woman. A very, very impressive human being. A very impressive woman. And that wasn't just simply about her beauty, but she was also uh, a woman of great intelligence. She was just very, very, she had a demeanor about her, very dignified, very noble in her conduct and demeanor, how she carried herself, how she condu- conducted herself, the way she spoke to people, she was impressive. She was very, extremely intelligent, thoughtful, thought-provoking. And so, when she was given into the custody of Thabit bin Qais, she went to Thabit and she said, look, I would like to broker a deal with you. You are a man of simple means. Alright? Thabit bin Qais, he was not a very wealthy man. So she said, rather than having another mouth to feed, because when somebody was put into somebody else's custody, a slave was given to someone, the Prophet ﷺ said about those slaves that were put into the custody of someone, prisoners of war that were given into someone's custody, the Prophet ﷺ said, يَأْكُلُونَ مِمَّا تَأْكُلُونَ وَيَلْبَسُونَ مِمَّا تَلْبِسُونَ They have to eat what you eat. They have to wear what you wear. So basically you ended up with another mouth to feed. So she said to him, she said, you don't seem to be a man of much means. You already seem to be financially struggling. And you'll have another mouth to feed. And if you received, you know, a prisoner of war, a slave, someone into your custody, a man, a lot of times the way that it would, you know, you could balance that out and at least make it so that that individual was paying for themselves their own food and board, was that you would put them to work. Maybe you would, you know, get them a job somewhere. You would kind of loan them out for some work. And you'd get paid for the work that they conducted. And that would basically at least pay for their room and board, their overhead. But in the case of women, that was also a lot more difficult because they weren't able to do the types of physical labor that some of the male slaves would be able to do. So in this particular instance, she says to him, she says, you don't have a lot of money, you barely are getting by yourself, you have another mouth to feed now, why don't we do this? I come from a background where I'm resourceful, I know people, my father is the leader of his tribe, and I just know overall how to talk to people, how to negotiate with people, how to you know, work out situations. I would like to propose a contract. I would like to purchase my freedom from you. This is a contract that the Arabs used to have at that time. It's known as mukataba. Mukataba. And the Quran speaks about this. Surah An-Nur, Surah number 24 speaks about this. Where Allah says, فَكَاتِبُوهُمْ إِنْ عَلِمْتُمْ فِيهِمْ خَيْرًا وَآتُوهُمْ مِمَّا لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَتَاكُمْ That the Quran actually encouraged the Muslims by saying that if you have slaves, then give them contracts where they are allowed to earn their freedom. So basically a contract is proposed, you go and you work and earn a thousand dollars, and you bring it, and your freedom will be granted to you. But then the Quran says, وَآتُوهُمْ مِمَّا لِلَّهِ الَّذِي آتَاكُمْ That after they've come and brought you the thousand dollars in exchange for which you will free them, then give them that thousand dollars as a gift to start their new life. And that was a practical way to transition people into a free life. Where they'd be able to earn their way and they'd be able to take care of themselves. Alright, so this is the mukataba contract. So she knowing, of course, this contract, she proposes the mukataba contract to Thabit bin Qais. Thabit bin Qais, of course, knowing his situation, that he could use a little bit of money is a lot more useful to him than another mouth to feed. So he accepts the contract. He says, absolutely, I'll take it. So she says, okay, perfect. Now she's out trying to figure out how she can basically get the money necessary for this particular contract. So she, again, she's resourceful. Remember, she's the daughter of the leader of a tribe. Right? The daughter of the leader of Banu al-Mustaliq. So she understands how negotiations work. How you talk to people. 
So she approaches the Prophet ﷺ directly. And she comes to meet the Prophet ﷺ, and she says to the Prophet ﷺ that, um, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of God, Ana Juwaidiyah bintul Harith ibn Abi Dirar, Sayyidi qawmihi. I am, at that time her name was Barra, so in post, in retrospect, as it's being narrated, her name is being mentioned as Juwaidi, and I'll explain the reason for that. But she says, I am the daughter of Al-Harith ibn Abi Dirar, who is the leader of his people. So my father is the chief of our clan. وَقَدْ أَصَابَنِي مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ مَا لَمْ يَخْفَ عَلَيْكَ And you see the difficult circumstance that I am in currently. I'm in a very difficult situation. I find myself in this predicament. فَوَقَعْتُ فِي السَّهْمْ لِثَابِتْ بِنْ قَيْسْ بِنْ شَمَّاسِ um, and I basically have fallen to the lot, into the custody of a man by the name of Thabid bin Qais. You're familiar with him, he's one of your uh, companions. فَكَاتَبْتُهُ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِي And I have proposed a contract in order to purchase my freedom from him. فَجِئْتُكَ أَسْتَعِينُكَ عَلَىٰ كِتَابَتِي And I have come to you to request your assistance in the paying off of that contract. Now, that might seem... You know, even somewhat ambitious or preposterous even to us. But again, a woman of great intelligence. She understands that being the daughter of the leader of her tribe is going to resonate with the Prophet ﷺ because the Prophet ﷺ was very, very sensitive to who people are and where they're coming from. And how to treat people and how to be sensitive and cognizant of people and, you know, what their status is amongst their own people. That showing generosity, showing kindness, and showing respect to someone that a whole tribe respects will actually earn their respect. And because the ultimate objective of the Prophet ﷺ was not to kill people, or defeat people, or enslave people. It was to bring people to Islam, as we're going to see here. And if there's a whole group of people that respect a particular individual, and you show them that person respect, you win the respect, and that, and depending on the gesture that, the gesture that you've made, if it's a, a significant enough of a gesture, you can actually earn the loyalty of those people. The admiration of those people, which only brings them closer to Islam. It is not a coincidence that one of the leaders of the opposition to the Prophet ﷺ, a man who led not one but multiple armies against the Prophet ﷺ, who was responsible for the killing of dozens of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and some of his, some of even his own family members, Abu Sufyan, would eventually soften towards Islam and the Prophet ﷺ and would become a Muslim. Because the Prophet ﷺ showed great respect to his daughter. Who was? Ummu Habiba. Ramla bin Tabi Sufyan. And the, the, the way the Prophet ﷺ looked after her and showed her great respect, it earned the admiration and the respect of the Prophet, uh, of Abu Sufyan. The Prophet ﷺ earned it. And that eventually softened him enough to the point to bring him to Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ, so Juwaidiya, Radiallahu ta'ala anha is very smart in this way. So she comes to the Prophet Sallallahu saying, I'm the leader of my pe- I'm the daughter of the leader of my people. I have a contract to earn my freedom. I would like your assistance. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, basically realizing the opportunity here, the Prophet Sallallahu says, فَهَلْ لَكِ فِي خَيْرٍ مِّن ذَلِكِ Let me do something better than that. Let me offer, let me suggest something superior. قَالَتْ وَمَا هُوَ يَا رَسُولَ الله. She says, what would that be, O Messenger of God? The Prophet ﷺ says, أَقْضِ عَنْكِ كِتَابَتَكِ وَأَتَزَوَّجُكِ The Prophet ﷺ said, I will fulfill your contract on your behalf. I'll pay thabit, whatever the fee is for setting you free. And then number two, I propose marriage to you. And she said, قَالَتْ نَعَمْ She said, yes, I accept. Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of God, I accept. And the Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ فَعَلْتُ I have taken care of it. And so in this manner, the Prophet ﷺ calls Thabit bin Qais, offers the amount, 
And she's freed. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ puts the proposal in front of her. And she accepts the proposal. And she becomes a wife of the Prophet ﷺ. And thereby becomes one of the mothers of the believers. Now, when I said the Prophet ﷺ saw the opportunity, and he actually says to her, let me suggest something better than what you're suggesting. What exactly was that hinting towards? What did the Prophet ﷺ foresee as an outcome of this? So the narration goes on to mention that وَخَرَجَ الْخَبْرُ إِلَى النَّاسِ أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم قَدْ تَزَوَّجَ جُوَيْدِيَ بِنْتِ الْحَارِثِ The word got out amongst the Sahaba that the Prophet ﷺ has married the daughter of Al-Harith, the leader of Banu Al-Mustaliq. And this was not a very, very large tribe. There were about a hundred families in this tribe. And so they all shared some type of relation with each other. Even in Quraysh we see that if it was not two or three, four, five, six, seven generations back, everyone's lineage used to intersect or meet up at some point. So in this manner, Banu Mustaliq, being a smaller tribe, they were all somewhat related, distantly albeit, but they were all related somehow. So when the word got out that the Prophet ﷺ has married the daughter of Al-Harith, the فَقَالَ النَّاسِ The people said, أَصْحَارُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. These are the in-laws of the Prophet ﷺ. And in-laws are to be held in a high regard and respect. Right? Because they are the family of someone. Right? Your in-laws are the family members of someone that is very near and dear to your heart. So they naturally are deserving of, you know, some level of respect and admiration and dignity. So the Sahaba said, these are the in-laws of the Prophet ﷺ. How can they be our slaves and servants? How can they be working in our fields? How can they be cleaning our homes? That doesn't make any sense to us. فَأَرْسَلُوا مَا بِأَيْدِهِمْ So all the Sahaba freed set free every one of the individuals of Banu Mustaliq. They set them all free. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, that, فَلَقَدْ أُعْتِقَ بِتَزْوِيجِهِ إِيَّاهَا That because of the Prophet ﷺ proposing and marrying Juwaydiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, مِئَةُ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ مِنْ Banu Mustaliq. A hundred families, a hundred homes, and a hundred families at that time means like there's a dozen or so individuals in each family. So nearly a thousand people, if not more, were set free solely by the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ in marrying Juwaydiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha. They were all set free. And the vast overwhelming majority of them accepted Islam and became Muslim. As a result of this gesture of kindness, the ultimate goal, the ultimate objective of bringing people to Allah. Connecting people to Allah, bringing people to Islam, and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, "Fama a'lamu imra'atan kanat a'adham barakatan ala qawmiha minha." I do not know of a single woman who was a greater source of blessing for her people than Juwaidiya radiallahu ta'ala anha. She not only brought freedom and dignity to her people, but she also brought Islam and iman, faith and belief and submission to Allah, and the success of the eternal life of the hereafter to our people. And understanding it in the context, these people not only became free, not only did they become Muslim, but these people by being in the company of the Prophet ﷺ, they also became sahaba. They also became companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Think of what it is, the status to be a sahabi or rasul. And this was all the outcome of this, you know, very remarkable um, you know, plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it displays the means of realizing this, this blessing of Allah was number one, the intelligence, the intelligence of Juwaidiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, the maturity of Juwaidiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, and the wisdom of course, the prophetic wisdom of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, Regarding Juwaidiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, since we're talking about her, there's a few more things I wanted to share about her. First and foremost about this particular incident, Al-Waqidi narrates that Juwaidiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that, رَأَيْتُ قَبْلَ قُدُومِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ بِثَلَاثِ لَيَالٍ 
She says three days before the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims arrived at Banu Mustaliq, I had seen a dream. I had seen a dream three days before they arrived. She says, كَأَنَّ الْقَمْرَ يَسِيرُ مِنْ يَفْرِبْ I saw that the moon was coming from the direction of Yathrib, in our direction. حَتَّى وَقَعَ فِي حِجْرِ Until the moon came to us, and it landed in my lap. Right? And the Qur'an, in the Qur'an, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Prophet as وَقَمَرًا مُنِيرًا Right? As an illuminating moon. Right? And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum constantly say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was more breathtaking than even the full moon. Laylat, uh, مِنَ الْقَمْرِ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدْرِ That he was more breathtaking than even the full moon. So she says that I saw this dream of the moon coming from Yathrib and landing in my lap. فَكَرِيْتُ أَنْ أُخْبِرَ بِهِ أَحَدًا مِنَ النَّاسِ I didn't want to tell anyone because I myself wasn't sure exactly what it, what it meant. حَتَّى قَدِيمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَلَمَّا سُبِينَ رَجَوْتُ الرُّؤْيَا Until everything that happened happened and when we were taken into custody, at that time the dream reoccurred to me and I was very hopeful because of that dream. فَأَعْتَقَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَتَزَوَّجَنِي and she says that the Prophet ﷺ eventually freed me and then proposed to me and married me. Wallahi ma kallamtu hu fi qawmi. Now the other thing that she says, a second thing, in the aftermath of you know all of her people being freed, she says that I, wallahi, I swear to God, I did not go to the Prophet ﷺ and request for my people to be freed. Meaning not that she didn't want freedom for her people, she said, I had not gotten to that point yet. I had not made this request yet. She says, حَتَّى كَانَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ هُمُ الَّذِينَ أَرْسَلُوهُمْ The Muslims made this decision themselves. They didn't even ask the Prophet ﷺ, should we do this? They just did it. The Prophet ﷺ had trained them and had trained them well. They knew what to do in that situation. They just freed all the people. وَمَا شَعَرْتُ And she says, I didn't even realize that this is what, this is what had transpired. إِلَّا بِجَارِيَةٍ مِن بَنَاتِ عَمِّي one of my cousins, a young girl from one of my cousins, she comes to visit me, and I'm like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and hatta tukhbirani al khabr. And then she told me, she says, don't you know, haven't you heard? We're all free. They set us free. And she says, at that time I realized, فَحَمِدْتُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى And I thanked and praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this remarkable outcome. Another, a third thing about Juwayriya radiallahu ta'ala anha, again, you know, as a consequence of her being freed, her father Al-Harith, later on, once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gets back to Medina, her, her father was amongst the people who had been set free. So what he does is, he now comes, he brings a bunch of camels with him, a, a, a bunch of, right, very nice, healthy, very expensive animals, impressive animals. He brings all of them as an offering, and he's on his way to Medina. And the reason why he's on his way to Medina, he says, what kind of a father am I? What kind of a leader am I? That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has made this amazing gesture of setting all my people free, freeing all of us, that I would not come to set my daughter free. Because he was like, I'm not sure if my daughter just went ahead and did this as a sacrifice in order to be able to free her people. So I will at the very least, what I need to do, what my responsibility as a father and as a leader is that I will go and make this offering, provide this gift to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I will say here, please take this, but let my daughter go. She did this for the sake of her people. She doesn't want to be here if that's the case, that she doesn't want to be here, then she doesn't want to be here, and you take this gift and let her go. I will ransom her, I will free her. So Al-Harith is now coming to Medina. While he's coming to Medina from Banu Al-Mustaliq, on the way, he, passes, he stops at a valley, you know, it's a long journey, he stops in a valley, and there's a couple of camels, he's got maybe, it doesn't matter in specific number, just for example's sake, think that maybe he has about a dozen camels. He looks at two of them that are like very impressive animals. Like really big strong camels. And he sees them and he says, you know, I could, I could really use them. I don't want to give these two away. I need these. So what he does is he ties them up there in a valley ex expecting that he's, you know, maybe a day's journey away from Medina. 
So he'll go there for a day, be there for a day, and come back in a day. He'll be back in two, three days. He ties him up there, leaves some food and water, and he says, he just stashes him there in the valley. And he says, on my way back, I'll pick him up and I'll take him home. Because I think I'll need these two camels. So he stashes him there. And now he arrives in Medina. He comes before the Prophet wasallam, And he says, you know, he says what I just mentioned. That, you know, my daughter did such and such, but I'm here in case she doesn't, she doesn't want to be here. She's here against her will to set her free, to ransom her. The Prophet wasallam says, you're a father. Nothing else would be expected of you. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, but don't you think it's fair? She's, she's, she's an adult, she's a woman, an independent woman. Don't you think it's fair that she should be allowed to make her own decision? That I don't just hand her over to you either? Right? And he says, of course, that makes a lot of sense. So Juwaidiya radiallahu ta'ala anha comes, and the father asks her, he says, daughter, I have brought these animals, I will offer them as ransom, and he's agreed to let you go if you want to go. And she says, Father, I, I, I believe. She shares her Islam, her Iman with him. And she says, this is the greatest blessing. And she tells her father about her dream. And how happy she is, and how honored and dignified she is. She's a mother of the believers. And so her father is very happy and very content. And she tells him that she would like to stay. Now the Prophet ﷺ turns his attention to Al-Harith. Because Al-Harith says, well, I've still brought these animals as a gift, as an offering to you. You have shown us generosity and kindness. You have treated my daughter well. Please let me still offer this as a gift. The Prophet ﷺ says, let's talk about your gift in just a minute. I have a question for you before that. He says, why did you leave those two camels in the valley? Why didn't you bring those two camels? Those are good camels. And he says, Ya Ajaba. He said, how do you know about that? And immediately he responds, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna ka Rasulullah. You have to be the messenger of Allah. You have to be the messenger of Allah. And he accepts Islam. And he goes back to his people and tells them, I have accepted Islam, and all of the people become Muslim as well. All of Banu Mustariq accepts Islam. So this was basically the outcome of the people of Banu Mustariq. Lastly and finally, about Juwaidiya radiallahu ta'ala anha. Her name, I, I kind of alluded to this in case it was confusing to someone, that Juwaidiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, her name was actually Barra. Barra. And interestingly, there were a few other women at the time of the Prophet. This was, a, this was a, somewhat of a common name for women amongst the, the Arab of that time. So Zainab bint Jahash, who would also become one of the mothers of the believers. She was a Qurayshi, as she was from Quraysh. Her name was also Barra. Maymuna radiallahu ta'ala anha, who, was, who would also become one of the mothers of the believers. She was the maternal aunt of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Her name was also Barra. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam changed Maymuna's name from Barra to Maymuna. He changed Zainab's name from Barra to Zainab. He gave her the name Zainab. And this was the third mother of the believer whose name before Islam was Barra. And the Prophet ﷺ changed it to um, Juwaidiya. And the reasoning that the Prophet ﷺ offered, not in the case of Juwaidiya, because it had already been done previously for Zainab bint Jahash, the reasoning the Prophet ﷺ offered was, لِأَنَّهَا تُزَكِّي نَفْسَهَا that basically the word barra comes from the meaning which means pious. But not just pious, like the word bir or bar, abrar, in al abrara lafi na'im, is like calling someone ahlul jannah. It's calling someone a person of paradise. And it still sounds nice in its meaning, but the Quran says, فَلَا تُزَكُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ The Quran basically instructs us that do not vouch for your own piety. Do not vouch for your own piety. Don't basically proclaim your own piety. I am a very righteous person. We don't do that. Right? That basically, we are very cognizant, very aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, this requires a little bit more explanation. So I don't want to just kind of summarily just state it. But at some level, we are taught to even be critical of ourselves. 
to be to constantly review our condition and ourselves. Right? So we're taught to constantly take a look at how we can improve, what we can work on. Not to basically self-congratulate and celebrate ourselves and pat ourselves on the back. That's we're not taught to do that. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, this name is basically, the Prophet ﷺ said, this name is spiritually pretentious. It's a pretentious name. Right? That to call yourself person of paradise. And so the Prophet ﷺ did not like the tone of that. And so he gave her the name Juwaidiyah. From that point on forward, she was known as Juwaidiyah, bint al-Hadith, uh, Zawju Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ummul Mu'mineen radiallahu ta'ala anha. And that's why even the narrations that are talking about her, like when she first you know, came into contact with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa or even the narration that's talking about when she introduces herself to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa her name at that time was so barra. But the Sahaba, when narrating that incident, they even change how she introduced herself, Ana Juwayriya, respecting the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said that's not a good name, and so they don't even relate that name to her any longer. But just the fact of the matter is, that was her name before Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ changed it for that reason. Juwayriya, radiallahu ta'ala anha, the mother of the believers, she continued to be there um, in the... Um, you know, service of the ummah, basically, you know, teaching, serving, um, and leading the ummah in her capacity as a mother of the believer. She is known to be a teacher of many of even the remarkable men of that generation and the next. Abdullah bin Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anha, used to learn from her. Abdullah bin Abbas narrates a hadith from her. Uh, Ubaid bin Sabbaq, he narrates a hadith from her. Kureib, Mujahid, one of the greatest scholars of the next generation, the Tabi'un, he narrates a hadith from Juwaidiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha. Abu Ayyub, Yahya bin Malik al-Azdi, narrates a hadith from her. And there are others who narrate a hadith from her as well. One of the very remarkable a hadith that are narrated by Juwaidiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha is found in Sahih Muslim. Where she says that, Ata alayya Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa ghudwatan, ghadwatan wa ana usabbihu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to visit me early in the morning time, and I was sitting making the dhikr, the tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was engaged in the remembrance of Allah. Thumman talaqa li hajatihi, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had some things to take care of, so he went to go take care of whatever he had to do. Thumma raja'a qariba min nisfin nahar. The Prophet ﷺ came back almost at noon time, hours later. فَقَالَ أَمَا زِلْتِ قَاعِدًا She says, I was still sitting there doing dhikr, tasbih. And he says, you've been sitting here the entire time for hours? قُلْتُ نَعَمْ I said, yes, I've been sitting here engaged in the remembrance of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ at that time said, أَلَا أُعَلِّمُكِ كَلِمَاتٍ لَوْ عَدَلْنَ بِهِنَّ عَدَلَتْهُنَّ that the Prophet ﷺ said that, shall I, O wuzina bihinna wazanat hunna. The Prophet ﷺ said, shall I not teach you a few words that if you were to measure these few words against your hours upon hours upon hours of devotion, they would be equal. They would be equal. So she said, of course, O oh Messenger of God, please teach me, please instruct me, please instruct me. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught her the following words, Subhanallahi adada khalqihi, Subhanallahi zinata arshihi, Subhanallahi rida nafsihi, Subhanallahi midada kalimatihi, three times each. Subhanallah, which is a proclamation about the perfection and the magnificence and the glory of Allah, that how absolutely perfect and glorious is Allah, that I, I offer the praise and the glorification of Allah in accordance with the number of His creation. Then I offer a glory, the, the glorification and the praise of Allah that is befitting the beauty and the majesty of His throne. I offer the praise and the glorification of Allah so that he may be pleased with me, in a way that he is pleased with. And I offer the praise and the glorification of Allah, according to the number of blessings that he has showered upon his creation. Subhanallahi adada khalqihi. 
سبحان اللہ ہی زینت عرشی ہی سبحان اللہ ہی ردا نفسی ہی سبحان اللہ ہی مداد کلیماتی ہی ہی تاٹھ ہر دیس پرٹیکلر ورڈز اینڈ آور مدر جویریہ رضی اللہ تعالی عنہ taught these words to all of us and they're authentically narrated in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. And just to conclude here about our mother Juwaidiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, that she would go on to live until the... There are two narrations. Some say that she lived uh, to the year 50 after Hijrah. 50 after Hijrah. So she lived 40 years after the Prophet ﷺ, and she passed away at that time. And some say she lived until the year 56 after Hijrah, and she passed away about 46 years after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, رضي الله تعالى عنها. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant, her, grant us her company in the life of the hereafter in paradise. And uh, we'll go ahead and conclude here by talking about our mother, Juwaidiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha. In the following session, the reason also why I'm kind of concluding here a little bit more brief than I usually do, um, is because the next event to talk about is the third major event that was after uh, the Battle of Banu al-Mustaliq that occurred on the return from this campaign. And that is the very... Uh, powerful and very major incident from the life of the Prophet ﷺ known as Waqi'atul Ifq, which was the incident of the slander of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and everything that transpired. So that'll require maybe even more than one session. So inshallah we'll delve into that next uh, in the next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything that we said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashad wa la ilaha illa anta, nashad wa natubu ilayk.